Brilliant, fantastic. Thank you all so much for coming. Today I'm going to be talking to you about making the most of the opportunity of being at home and to share with you some of the lessons I've learned from books, from actual coaching of people, just from myself and some things I've done and hopefully so you can get the most out of this opportunity. It is a very big opportunity that we've all got at the moment. To start off with talk about furlough leave. At the moment a lot of us are on this thing called furlough leave. You might not know, you might not know what it actually is. Domenica does, I do, and some of you might not know what it is. Essentially, for small businesses and some other businesses where employees can't do their normal work, the government has agreed to pay 80% of their salary, but that means those people cannot work, which means you have time at home where you cannot work while you're getting paid 80% of your salary, which means what do you do in that time if you're not allowed to work? And it's gonna cover some of those things. If you are not one of those people, you might just be in a different circumstance where suddenly you can't leave the house. And that means you're saving probably at least two hours a day of travel time. I know people like Mary are going round in the four by four, going door to door everywhere, and that saves a lot of time for traveling. No trips to London, no catching trains, saves you money, saves you time. And so as you're not traveling, that is some extra time you've got as well. So even if you're not on furlough leave, because you are staying at home and you can just every day get out of bed and walk into an office at the end of the room, you save a lot of time. And what you're going to do with this time is important. Crisis can mean opportunity. I know it's a misnomer saying that in Chinese, if you put the characters together, it can mean danger and also opportunities. It has been disproven or so I've heard. However, it's worth just remembering it that actually it might seem like a crisis, but being at home has a really big opportunity at the moment. And there's a lot that we can do with this opportunity. Um, so all I'm gonna ask you today is just please don't waste the opportunity. The reason why I really wanted to give this webinar is because I care about people so much and I see it as this humongous opportunity and I want you to get the most out of it. I really do. And so hopefully at the beginning, with these ideas in mind, you can go on to get the most out of it and just hopefully achieve all you want to. Today we're going to be covering goal setting, taking useful, oh, 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 I need to make you all a bit smaller, taking useful notes, online coaching, and also how to practice, which is all really important stuff. And the how to practice is based on some of my time learning magic, some of my time learning other skills, and essentially it's going to be very useful for you so you can get to grips with whatever it is you want to become proficient at. Let's begin with goal setting. Goal setting is probably one of the most fatigued and often talked about things when it comes to Toastmasters, when it comes to business, and so I'm hoping to give you a bit of a fresh perspective on this. We're not going to be talking about smart targets. We're not going to be talking about the things you normally would. We're going to talk about things, hopefully, that will work and be interesting for you. Start off with an imagination exercise. I want you to imagine you're the last person on earth. Could be pretty easy to imagine. You're not going out the house anyway. Just imagine there's no one else in all the other houses. Imagine you're the only person left. Imagining this, what would you like to learn? If you're the last person on earth, what would you like to learn or what would you want to achieve? If you want to learn to ride the unicycle, you've got to be honest with yourself. Do you want to learn to ride the unicycle so that other people will applaud you and say, wow, you're amazing on that unicycle? Or are you doing it because you think it would be really fun to learn the unicycle and actually it would benefit your work and your life and it would just make things a lot more fun? 
if you can be honest with yourself about that distinction, it's going to help. Because if you are learning the unicycle just for other people's approval, you are going to keep on learning it until the day you don't get any approval. The first time you stroll up to the office on a unicycle, everyone's going to say, wow, look at you, that's fantastic. The second or third time, people aren't going to care anymore, which means you're going to give it up. Whereas if you are doing it because intrinsically you enjoy the skill, you're going to keep it up. This idea comes from the book, The Courage to be Disliked, where it uses this exercise, just imagining you're the last person on earth, and then just imagining what you would be doing with your time. And I think this is especially poignant at the moment, as it can feel a bit like this. And we need to adjust and think, what can I do for me that I am going to enjoy or is going to make my life easier, as opposed to what should I do that I feel like other people would expect me to do? And this can include family or parents or anyone. You might feel like, oh, I am going to learn French because my parents have always wanted me to learn French. Or I am going to learn Spanish because then I can show off to my friends that I know another language. That's no good. For me, do it for you if you want to follow through. Do it for you if you want to follow through. Find something that you really want to do and that you want to enjoy. And so have a little think about this as we go through today. And hopefully by the end, you'll find something that you want to do. As part of this, I think it's important to set yourself interesting challenges. And this is where I think most goal setting falls flat. Most goal setting is usually something generic, such as I want to lose weight and I am going to lose weight by exercising for 30 minutes a day. That's not very interesting. It's not going to get you buzzing and it's not going to get you excited. Set yourself more interesting challenges. Essentially, stop setting stuffy goals like that because they're rubbish. They're rubbish. Stop setting rubbish goals. I want you to write a goal that is going to have you beaming from ear to ear and get so excited about it. What would you prefer? I am going to do a bit of exercise so I, I, I'm a bit thinner. Or I'm going to work out every day so I feel like Superman. And my goal is to wear a Superman cape and feel the real deal. You know, what's going to get you beaming from ear to ear? That's what you should be doing. Here's an example, manga. With myself, I thought it would be quite fun to learn to read Japanese. And I say read Japanese, not speak Japanese, because I thought if I could read Japanese, I could read Japanese manga. I'm a huge comic book nerd, and how fun would that be to read all these Japanese comic books? See, it's not saying I want to learn Japanese to speak Japanese, because I don't know anyone who's Japanese. Who am I going to speak to? I'm not doing it to show off that I can speak another language. Why do I want to do that? I'm being honest and exciting myself by saying, think about all those comics I could be reading if I could read this language. How cool would that be? And that is going to motivate me and excite me to actually embark on this challenge. And that's the thing. If you're excited by thinking about it, you're going to do it. Whereas if you're not excited by thinking about it, you won't be excited to do it. And so this is where linguistics is important. Find a way of phrasing your goal in such a way that you feel really excited to go and do it. And I, I genuinely think this will affect your motivation because it's all about morale now. It really is. The next part is share your goals. But how do you share your goals? You might be thinking, what do I do? One way which Nick, Claire and I have tried in the past is to have, an on, have a 12 week year party. You can now do this online. This is based on the book, The Twelve Week Year. Essentially, in The Twelve Week Year, it states, each week you treat like a calendar month. So you try to achieve in a week 
that you'd normally achieve in a month. That means after 12 weeks, it would have been a year. Aha. Uh -huh. Then what happens is after that year, you then celebrate online and with your friends and you say what things you have achieved and what things you want to achieve over the next 12 weeks. And that's exciting because it's going to drive you on for the next month or so thinking about, oh, wow, yeah, I think it's going to be fantastic to hear other people's goals and be able to share what I've been up to. Brilliant. thing you can do host your own event <laughs> what do I mean by host your own event put it this way everyone knows at least three or four people who can come online everyone knows that why don't you find a group of friends or a group of people you can talk to who are interested in a similar subject and you read about it in your free time or at least you're kind of interested in it each person is to teach a 20 minute lesson each on that subject about something that interests them. For friends, that is an 80 minute event you've got instantly where you get to learn interesting things that you really care about. I think that just makes a lot of sense because then instead of feeling bored and feeling like, oh, I'm not learning anything, oh, I can't spend a thousand pounds going to these online events create your own. Just find four people who are interested in a topic. Say, can you speak for 20 minutes on something about this topic? That would be fantastic. Some magicians do this and what they end up doing is one person will say, look, I want to teach this interesting thing about how to shuffle cards. One person might say, this is how I store all of my coins and keep them looking nice and clean and shiny for when I do my performances. Someone else might say, well, I was reading this history book and this is what I learned about it. Let me tell you all about this book for 20 minutes. It's relaxed. It's informal. Originally with this idea, you'd have dinner together as well. You can't really do that at the moment, but it's just a nice thing you can throw together very quickly. One problem that people have when learning new stuff is overbuying stuff. I have this problem <laughs> and so I'm sure other people do too. And all I'd say is don't overbuy, be honest. Be honest with yourself. What do you need to achieve your goal? What do you need? Going back to our unicycle example, what do you need to learn to ride the unicycle? Clearly, don't be stingy you need a unicycle. Don't just say I can just get a free PDF and that's all I need. Invest enough so you have what you need, but don't buy everything because you don't need to. Overbuying stuff is just a way not to get started, essentially. I cannot start to learn to draw because I need to have all of the art books in existence first. I cannot start to do this because uh, I can't start to learn cooking because I've not got the electric whisk. Uh, I, I've not got the electric egg beater. I've not got all these little Tupperware containers. I, I possibly, I can't get started on this. I just can't, I'm sorry. It's just an excuse. And so just invest in some good stuff, the stuff that you actually need. And then just know as well that you can always get stuff as you go along. It's all right to say actually work on something and think, oh, I need some sandpaper. I better order this. But you don't need to wait 12 weeks for sandpaper to arrive before you start on whatever you're doing, especially if it's making ice cream. The next thing is break your goal down. Now, with smart targets, that's where they'd make it super, super specific and make it time bound. I'm not asking you to do that. All I'm saying is, Break it down into months, weeks, days, hours. Get an Excel document and know what you're doing each day. Just plan out what you want to be doing each day. And actually, I think this is more of a reflective exercise. Because let's say, for example, you want to get good at cooking. You could just write down what you've cooked each day. And then as you look through what you've cooked each day, you can then plan ahead and think, 
right, I've not used eggs in any of these recipes. I think next week is going to be egg week. I'm going to use eggs in all of these, egg, in all these recipes. So by just noting down what you've done, that's going to be super helpful. And then you can then plan what you want to do in the future. I think that's a lot more helpful than just saying, I want to learn to cook. I will know how to cook by this date. Instead, just write down what you're going to do each day. If you feel really out of water, not having a schedule, and you are used to being at work at 8.50 and you're used to finishing at six o'clock and you feel really lost without a calendar, this is what I want you to do. Start of every day, write down five things you want to get done. Pretty much everyone who works from home does this. It's a fantastic way to stay on target. Just write down five things you want to get done. That way you do not spend your whole day in your pajamas. That way from the very beginning, you know five things you want to get done and then you can actually relax at the end of the day. Because that's the other problem as well, is you might think, ah, oh, I've been at home all day. I don't deserve to relax. I feel like a lazy bum. Whereas if you've written down five things you want to do and you have done those five things, you can then relax and know, yeah, I've got done so much stuff today. Fantastic. Start of the day, five things you really want to get done. Now we're going to get into do your research. Do your research. When you're doing goals, it's good to find accounts from people who have done it before. It makes sense. We talked a bit about overbuying. You can find online, if someone else has done it before, they might say, I bought all the equipment and that wasn't very helpful. I actually found it more helpful to do this. It's worth having a look out there or asking someone you know who's done it before. Find someone who's already done it. It just makes sense. We like to imagine that we're each such an individual special snowflake that no one has had our trail of thought before and that what we're doing is completely unique when really most people have done what it is we're embarking on at some point. So just find out from other people what they would recommend, what they would recommend not doing as well. But what I'd say is look at several different sources. You're going to find people online who say, oh, that's rubbish. Don't get into that. That's awful when they've only tried it once. Find a nice mixture and eventually you will find an authority that kind of rises to the top. So really do look at different sources. But most importantly, start. Start. Whatever it is you want to do, start. <laughs> so that's easier said than done. And you might be thinking, well, I don't know how to start, Matt. Can you tell me how? This is, this is a good way. Set a timer for two minutes. No matter what it is you want to do, set a timer for two minutes. As an example, let's say you're sitting on your sofa and you want to do some tidying up and you keep putting off starting and you think maybe I can check my emails five more times and hope something comes into the inbox and then I can sit down a bit longer. Set a timer for two minutes, get up, and say, I'm going to tidy for these two minutes. And after that, I can stop. Now, I pretty much guarantee you, if you do this, after the two minutes, you're going to think, I'm happy carrying on. I'm more than happy to carry on doing this. I feel proud of myself for starting. The starting is the bit we all find hard. So if you can find some strategies to get you to start stuff, they actually carrying on with it is pretty easy. It's the starting that's hard. It's like in a conversation, especially for English people. If you go up to someone in the street, it's hard to start the conversation, but it's pretty easy to carry it on as they're asking you questions and you're asking them questions. It's the finding the ways to start. And this is one of my favorite ways to set time of two minutes. And when you're learning, it's important to remember the bell curve. So here we have a nice bell curve. 
when you learn stuff or when you start something for the first time, let's use exercise for this one. Let's say you want to become a bodybuilder. Ha <laughs> ha You're learning bodybuilding. As you start bodybuilding, you gain muscle really, really quickly. Really quickly. And so it's super easy. So as time goes on, the speed you pack on muscle goes more, 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 more. And then eventually it slows down. It's important for two reasons. Firstly, if you do start something, you are going to improve really, really quickly at it. Put it another way, learn a new language, you don't know any words, which means you can learn a hundred words no problem because there's so many of them to learn. So it makes sense to start and you will feel good because you think, wow, I've made a lot of progress. This example is important for another reason, because if you are not starting something new, let's say you're working on something you are doing already, you're going to go down the other side of the bell curve, which means the speed you develop is going to go down and down and down the more specialised you get. However, it's important to know that although you're not going from a 0% proficiency to a 50% like instead you're working on going from a 69% proficiency to a 70 or 71% over the same time, that's what's going to make you an expert and make you a visionary in what you're doing and essentially make you a master craftsperson because you're sacrificing your time for that 1% or 2% improvement and it's worth your time just as much. Do not feel threatened that some young buck has only started using Adobe Photoshop for one week and they're producing better artwork than you used to because it's very easy as a beginner. When you're a beginner, you have lots of improvement. When you become more advanced, it's slower to improve but it's still worth doing. So don't lose heart. Know that these young bucks who are starting something are going to improve very quickly at the beginning. Just you do you, ignore them, carry on. And if you just can't think of a goal, I know there might be some of you at the end who have no goals, have no idea what to do and think, Matt, I a sort of waste of my time. What do I do? Here is my answer for you. It's from Seth Godin. Just record your thought of the day. If you have no goal at all, for this time you're stuck at home, every day you're thinking about something, write down your most poignant thought. You can write this in a blog. You can just write it down on a piece of paper. Record it somewhere. Because let's say you're stuck at home for two months. That's 60 days, which means you'll have 60 thoughts written down. That's a book. You'll have enough for a book, or you'll have enough for speeches for the next five years. You will have plenty of things all down, and then you will feel like, that was a good use of my time. I've got some really good thoughts down that I never would have had. The magician Andy Gladwin was interviewed about Corona, and he said, it's an exciting time because giving people time to think and work on stuff they normally wouldn't have been able to do. So if you can't think of anything you want to do in this time, at the least, just record your thought of the day. Note taking. Haha. -ha! You might think I'm the last person to talk about note taking, but actually I love taking notes. I just don't like using them in speeches. <laughs> when should we take notes? This is Drew Davis and he gave a very interesting talk on a podcast. And essentially his idea was this. If you're watching something but not taking notes, then it's not research. It's not. It's watching TV or it's watching YouTube. If you're taking notes on what you're watching, it becomes research. It's important distinction there. It's easy to fool ourselves and think, 
oh, I've been busy today. I've been researching this. But if you're just watching it, it's not research. So I'm gonna give you some help in how to actually take notes effectively based on the stuff we watch, the stuff we listen to, so it becomes research. Go in with questions to learn from the experience. This is the clincher here. If you go into a video thinking, I want to learn this, this, and this, or I want to measure this, this, and this, it's research. So how to take notes on TV shows and videos. I recommend for this that you take notes digitally. I like to use a piece of software in the top right corner called Evernote because it's free and it does everything I need to. However, there's lots of other things available to you, such as Google Keep on the Android phone. And I think there's Apple products as well, but I'm not an Apple user, so I wouldn't know. Don't like my fruit very much. There's plenty of digital platforms available for you to use. And I like using them because you can copy and paste and you can share your notes. It's fine. It's fine to have paper notes as well. But the problem with it is realistically, are you going to type them up? And how much time are you going to waste typing them up? For this exercise, just do it digitally. You can use an Excel sheet. You can use anything you like just to record it digitally so you can copy and paste. Now, these are the things that you should be noting down when you are watching stuff. What you watched, where you found it, the date, new information and stats you learned, things that impacted you, and categorical observations. Here's why. Here's why. You want to know what you watched where you found it and the date you might wonder why have a think why the answer is so you can reference it if you want to write a blog post or write a book and you want to use the information or even give a speech having a record of where you found the information and the date is imperative it's not enough just to say i read wikipedia and found this you need the date as well, because Wikipedia can change every day, because someone could go on Wikipedia five months later and suddenly, oh, the article's changed now. <laughs> Someone's edited it, it's changed. Or you could go on YouTube to watch the video again and oh, it's been deleted. So you need to record the date, where you found it and what you watched, so you can reference it. So if ever you write something or you speak and someone challenges you, you can just dig up your notes all digitally recorded and say, here you go. Here's what I watched, where I found it, the date. Makes you rock solid and very professional as well. New information and stats, because they're very useful to have to hand. So if ever you do want to do some writing, you've got them there to back up your arguments. Self-explanatory, fantastic. Things that impacted you. Each of us are unique in that different things affect us and impact us. And so if you watch something and something moves you, either to laughter or to tears, or you think it's just very cool, make a note of that. Because that might keep popping up again and again and again, and that might help you in the development of your character, your themes, your future interests, I think that's a very important thing to take note of. And lastly, we have categorical observations. Meow. Cat. Here's what I mean by that. Come up with five categories. I would say come up with five categories for the week. And you can always repeat them. Here's what I mean. Five things you want to learn. If you have five things you want to learn and really focus on, it will help. Let's say that I want to learn this week jokes, posture and movement, how to create empathy when I speak. I want to really research use of voice and impressions and how people do that. And I want to also research the use of surprise, how to surprise people, how to surprise an audience, how to surprise people with my filmmaking. They're my five categories.
and I've numbered them one, two, three, four, five. You can either write this down on a piece of paper or you just create an Excel document and create a column for each one. One, two, three, four, five. Easy. Then whenever you watch something, you just write down one of those columns or one of those categories, the stuff you come across. Ah, oh, let's give you an example. This is Roberto Giobi, funny story about him. Claire and I went to a magic convention and he was telling me all about his coding idea for this. And he wrote it all down on a piece of paper for me. And then afterwards, he got very upset because he thought I'd stolen his pen. And he started saying to me, where's my pen? You've stolen my pen, you've stolen it. And I had not stolen his pen. But it made me remember this system even better. His idea, was to, when you take notes, just write down a category in the margin for what it falls under. So if you're taking a note on someone's speech, you might take notes, take notes, take notes, hear a funny joke and think, oh, that's category one, jokes. So you just write down in the column, joke, and write down the joke. Simple example. But I think actually just having it as a code, one, two, three, four, five, is a lot easier. And this, here's how I'd use it. Say we're watching Mr. Bean. Hardly research or isn't. You're watching Mr. Bean and then you see a bit and you write down category two, which is posture and movement. Okay, category two. By doing a double take at this time stamp, Rowan Atkinson gets twice as many laughs. Now I've recorded the timestamp as well as a link to the video so I can find it and watch it later. So now immediately, I have got something that's useful to me. Instead of just saying, what have you done today? I watched Mr. Bean. <laughs> you can say, I learned something today about posture and gesture. And here are my notes on it. So then you can put all of your notes from a particular category on the same page. Ha, huh. ha. Huh. So by the end of the week, you will have five unique pages of notes. You'll have a whole page of jokes. You'll have a whole page of posture and movement, a whole page on creating empathy a whole page on the use of surprise you'll have notes that you couldn't get from anywhere else just from your usual viewing because our memories aren't so good we forget stuff if we take notes in this way we'll have some very useful things to use and now hopefully you can see the difference between just watching videos and doing research because if you end with these notes but at the end of it you can go through them you can use them and they can help you you've got something to show for your time spent doing it and in just a second we're going to go on to getting the most out of online coaching but i'll just give you a second just to have a little think again have a think about what goals you would want to achieve and maybe even what categories you want to work on for the next week Getting the most out of online coaching. I've done a lot of online coaching. I have also been coached online a fair bit. And so I'm gonna share with you some of the lessons I've learned because now, as I said earlier, there's a lot of people at home who aren't usually at home very much, who are used to being on the road and doing stuff, who could now coach you. If you want coaching, now is the time to find a coach. My advice is find someone who is way better than you at something. Not a little bit better, way better than you at something. And I think go big or go home. This here is Chris Ryder, also known as Hercules. Let's see what he did there. It's like Hercules, but it's Hercules because he's hairy. 
and uses his hair a lot. I came across Hercules when I was looking for someone to learn card tearing from. I wanted to be able to take a deck of playing cards and rip it in half. I found about 12 people teaching this skill. I had a look around and I found out that most of them made a right meal of it and they really struggled to do it and it in such weird ways it looked like they were cheating. I just wanted to learn from someone who could just take it, rip it in half, no problem. Hercules made it look like liquid butter. It was just soft butter in his hands straight through. And I knew that was the person to learn from. And you've got to have these same kind of standards when you're looking for a coach. Don't go for someone and think, oh, they'll do. Yeah, they're a bit better than me. Look for someone who is way better than you and actually can create the effect that you are expecting. If, for example, you want to be coached by someone on happiness, find someone who's ridiculously happy. Don't find someone who's just a bit happier than you. Go big or go home. Ask if they do coaching. When you've been inspired by someone, just ask if they do coaching. A lot of people now, especially independent people, don't have a job. And so they're more likely to say, yeah, I, I can coach you. Or I can mentor you even better. You might find a mentor now. And if they say they don't, just ask, can I have a call with you to ask some questions? A lot of people probably will and say, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to have a call with you to do some questions. Let's go for it. All I'd say is be prepared to pay for it. <laughs> it's a bit of an assumption to think that people are going to give up their time for free, but a lot of people will. And a lot of people are very happy to give you a call for free, but be prepared to pay for it. And this could mean paying money, giving a testimonial, or doing something mega creative. I mentioned Drew Davis earlier. I really, 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 really wanted to have a call for my birthday with Drew Davis. Now, this is a guy who charges a heck of a lot of money to do public speaking. <laughs> and I thought, how is this guy? Yeah, I, I can't afford to give him thousands of pounds for a coaching call. I just can't. How can I get his attention? And so with Claire's help, we made this really creative mystery box for him and filled it with all kinds of things. I even wrote a rap for him. It was a mini escape room in it with puzzles and all kinds of things. Claire made him a stamp with his logo on it, made it mega creative. He loved it, and I got to have a call with him. And so even if you don't have money to spend on coaching, be creative. Maybe you have something to offer. Maybe this person is a great artist, but you are a great copywriter, or you are a good editor, or you're good at something else, and you can offer it in exchange. Just an idea. And of course, research them. <laughs> Before you have a call with this person, research them as much as possible. I once had a call with a computer expert and it was the most embarrassing call ever because I made the most amateurish mistake. Where after 15 minutes, I said, I haven't actually got any other questions. I haven't got any other questions. And it's simply because I hadn't done enough research. Before you have a coaching call with someone, I want you to make sure you checked out their website. You've looked if they've got any videos on YouTube. Make sure see if they've done any podcasts, any interviews, find out as much about them as you can so you can ask the best questions. And the more you know about them, the more then you can say, I didn't understand what you meant by this very in-depth topic. So they can go into more detail. Because what you don't want is them to go over the basics of their approach and their theory with you when you can find that anywhere. What a waste, what a waste. Go into specifics. I'm going to give you some help with questions as well. 
But first as well, take notes during the call. You might want to act super cool and be like, I'm not taking any notes. I'm just having a chat with my mate. Look at my mate here. But seriously, take notes. They're going to recommend books for you. They're going to give you advice. They're going to talk about theories with you. Just write them down. Or better yet, ask if you can record the session. On Zoom, you can make a recording, ask if you can record it. You can even download a Skype recorder to record the call. Just ask their permission and just ask, could I record this? <laughs> I've got a really bad memory. It would really help if I could record it and then watch it back. I'd get so much out of that. And they might just say, yeah, of course you can. Make the most of it. And as I said, ask a lot of questions. And you might have trouble with this. You might be one of these polite people. One of these polite people who doesn't like to ask questions. I used to be one of these people, and I'm here to help you with this, to overcome this weakness. <laughs> Firstly, make sure that anything you want to ask, ask them, even if it's off topic. If you watch someone's videos and you think, oh my gosh, I absolutely love their kitchen blinds. You might be talking about social media stuff, but it's perfectly fine to ask them, where did you get your kitchen blinds? It's totally fine. You can ask anything you want to. If you have a question for them while you are with them, ask the question. So you see anything you want to know, just ask. The worst they're going to say is, I don't know. That's the worst. Just ask them. Even if something silly like, where did you get your shirts? I just really want to know. How can I work on this? I just really want to know. Just ask. Here are some example questions, because like me, a recovering, having a problem to ask a question person, you might be having <laughs> the same problem. So here are some example questions you can ask. I, a while ago, I was in a situation where blank happened. What would you have done? I think this is a very good question to ask when you've got the expert in the room. Just be honest and say what happened to you. Don't lie, be honest, say what happened and then just ask what they would have done. And you might actually hear a really good solution to the problem. So next time you'll know what to do. Question number two. I have this specific problem. What would you suggest? Get specific. Now, this is where I think most people fail at coaching calls. If you have a 30 minute coaching call, do not spend 28 and a half minutes going over your life story and showing off. But go into enough detail so you can be specific. So that means be honest. You don't need to impress them. You don't need to show off. Just be honest and then get very specific about your problem and ask what they would suggest. I watched your video on blank. Could you elaborate a bit more on what blank is? If you've done your research, you're gonna have these specific questions you can ask. And that means you can get greater understanding than most people would get. And again, the worst they can say is, oh, that's interesting. I haven't really thought about that before. I don't know. Who are your inspirations? Now, this, <laughs> this, this idea, incidentally, came from Usher's masterclass. Can't believe that, from Usher's masterclass. He said that most people on earth think about who is the greatest dancer. So who is the greatest dancer? Most people are gonna say, Michael Jackson. And most people are gonna research, how do I dance like Michael Jackson? However, if you find out who Michael Jackson was influenced by, you can find some other people who are actually just as good, if not better. For example, James Brown. James Brown was an amazing dancer, and a lot of his dance moves are very similar to Michael Jackson's. And so if you are inspired by someone, find out who inspired them. And then you can see what they did to change from that inspiration to being who they are now. 
super great question. And as an example, when I was researching Seth Godin, I was so interested in whose inspirations were. And he said about how he was really interested in Tom Peters. And I got to learn all about Tom Peters and how he was interested in Zig Ziglar. You learn all these names and you can connect the puzzle and understand how different people have been influenced by others. Uh, next question is, what was your first impression of me? How can I work on that? You might not want to ask this question, but it's just a thought. If you feel a bit self-conscious about yourself and you want an honest opinion, just ask, because you never know. They might see you a lot better than you see yourself. You never know. And also, what books would you recommend? Just, this is a throw out question. That is a good one. If you are coming to the end of your session, got nothing else to ask, make the most of your time, what books would you recommend? It's a good thing to ask. And then lastly, make sure you type your notes up afterwards and take action. So if they said to you, I recommend skipping every morning for five minutes, get skipping. Do whatever it is you need to do, but make sure you type up your notes. And if needed, and if you can, add them to your lists of categories. Even better. We're getting now into part four, effective practice. How to practice effectively. 15 minutes a day is better than three hours on a Sunday. It's by Eugene Berger. It is better to spend 15 minutes a day practicing something than to spend most of Sunday doing it. It's just a fact. You get a lot more thinking time that way and you can see some actual improvement. The problem with learning skills is people think they need to spend hours and hours and hours doing it. 15 minutes a day is better than nothing. If you want to get better at something, and you don't know where to find the time still, just think about this. Is there something you can do to improve whilst you're watching TV? Is there something you can do while you're watching TV? Probably you can draw while you're watching TV. You can learn card shuffling while you're watching TV. You can knit while you're watching TV. You can do some squats while you're watching TV. There's a lot of stuff you can do while watching the TV. Because if, like me, you still like a bit of TV, but you want to be productive at the same time, think about, is there anything you can do while watching TV? It's a good way to get some extra time. Have your stuff close to hand. And most importantly, most importantly, <laughs> don't lock it in a cupboard. <laughs> if you want to get good at something, let's say you want to get good at, oh, let's use juggling. Let's say you want to get juggling. If you have all your juggling stuff hidden at the back of a cupboard, and every single time you want to start juggling, you need to go to the cupboard, open it, Trawl through the cupboard, find your juggling stuff, come out, close the door, get started, clean the floor, do a bit of juggling. You're only going to juggle about once or twice a week. You're not going to improve very much. Whereas if your juggling balls are at the foot of the stairs, so every time you're about to go upstairs, you see them, you pick them up, have a little juggle. You could be juggling five times a day just for a little bit. And so you're, as they're close to hand, you can keep practicing. And that's something I'd really recommend if you are practicing a physical skill, just have it close to hand. Or even if you're doing artwork, just being able to just pick it up and do some drawing, much better than thinking, I need to go to my special craft drawer now and dig out my special craft book and find my special craft pencil because that's five minutes. You could have just have done it already. Have your stuff close to hand. And now on something that's quite unique to this talk, how to shake up your practice sessions. Because we've talked before about saying what you're going to be practicing, but now we're going to get more into 
how to shake it up so you get the most out of these practice sessions. This is a strong man called Bud Jeffries, and in his books, he talks about lifting odd objects. Normally, bodybuilders lift weights. Shocker. <laughs> they lift weights, they lift barbells, they lift kettlebells. But Bud Jeffries recommends you lift objects that aren't weights, maybe a giant rock. Maybe you find some kind of tire that's a weird shape. Maybe you want to practice lifting a seesaw. Something odd, something different. I wonder why. We'll find out in a second. The idea of grabbing a tennis ball. I went to, it wasn't a camp, it was, it was more of a, a lecture session by Ben Earl. Ben Earl was one of the best card magicians still is. And his piece of advice was, get a tennis ball, stick it underneath your arm while you're doing your card shuffling. Reason why is most people practice shuffling like this. So when they go out into the real world and they're walking about like this, they can't do it. And so his advice was, change how you practice make it slightly uncomfortable, put a tennis ball under your arm, stand on one leg, walk around while you're doing it, because that's going to prepare you for the real world. And this is what Bud Jeffries meant by lifting odd objects. When I first started university, I quite enjoyed the local gym because it made me feel very manly and I got to lift weights and that was very nice. But then I went to Tesco and I got a very heavy set of shopping bags and I really struggled. Why? Because they're all lopsided and weight. You feel it digging into your fingers. You're trying to balance yourself. You're going up hills. It's very different to clinically picking up a weight and just doing this. Balancing, going all over the place. I wasn't prepared for it. Similarly, Let's say you want to become a rock star. It's very different when you are sitting on your bed and you are just playing a few chords to when you are standing on stage, you've had a bit to drink, people are shouting at you, it's quite hot, your fingers are sweaty and you're trying to play. Very different environment. And so the more we can challenge ourselves in our practice sessions, the easier it's going to be in real life. I do this a lot with, pe with people for public speaking practice because I think the harder we can make it in practice the easier it's going to be in real life because they're going to think oh this is so easy <laughs> no one heckled me no one threw anything at me this was such an easy practice session and I've got some ideas for you on how you can challenge yourselves let's imagine you want to bake try baking without the recipe that's a challenge just bake without it. See how you get on. If you make mistakes, find out where you made the mistakes. If you're learning to speak French, say to yourself, well, today I'm not allowed to use my most used phrases. See how you get on without them. Because then what happens is if you're actually speaking French with someone and they don't understand your most used phrases or you have forgotten them, you're fine. You can carry on. If you're running, Try running with your arms up like this, or like this. So then the days when you're struggling to get up a hill, you think, oh, I'm so glad I've got my arms down here, not up there. That would have been hard. Juggling again. If you learn to juggle, learn to juggle while walking. That way, if one goes side like this, no problem. Writing, write about a subject you hate. That way, if you have to write about a subject you don't like quite so much, it's no problem. If you're learning to sing or, pl or play the piano, change the order of the song. <laughs> if you're playing Happy Birthday to You, mix it up. Change it all around a little bit so you understand how it really works. And also, if you mess up then, you're fine. You can create a new song. All good. These are all ways to spice up your practice sessions in such a way that you get the most out of it. So seriously, when you're about to practice something, 
have a think, how can you make it a bit harder on yourself? It doesn't need to be crazy, but just a bit harder. So then in real life, real world situation, if something happens, it's not gonna phase you in the slightest. You're gonna be so relaxed about it. And now we're gonna go over the scariest, <laughs> but the fastest way to improve. And I know some of you do this already and you're very good for doing it. Film your practice sessions. <laughs> it is the fastest way to improve if you just film yourself and watch it back. If you film yourself and watch it back, you can understand what you're doing wrong and you can move on from there. Let's go through, through the examples together. Let's say you're baking. If you film yourself, you can actually see how you are spending the time when you're baking. Are you spending 10 minutes faffing around looking for the ingredients and your recipe? Are you not doing things in a logical order? Are you maybe getting a bit flustered when the dough starts sticking to your fingers? Have you not prepared things properly? You'll find that out. Speaking French, you'll see, do you feel relaxed while you're doing it? Does it sound good? Are you pronouncing things right? You can then send the footage to your coach and they can evaluate you and give you some help. Aha, running. What's to stop you from running, filming yourself, and then comparing that to footage of Usain Bolt running? Nothing, there's nothing stopping you. Just find some footage and then see what's he doing with his legs? Am I doing that? No, what do I need to do? And then keep filming it until you run the same way. Nothing stopping you from doing it. Juggling, film yourself while juggling. Does it look good? How can you make it look better? Are you just looking up like this all the time? Maybe a smile would help. <laughs> Writing. Okay, I'll give you that one. Maybe you shouldn't film that one. Changing the order of a song. Yes, film it. Does it sound good? Do you seem flustered when you're having to change it? Are there ways to have more composure? So in a real life performing situation, you can be cool and collected. And when you get stuck, watch how experts do it. I've been reading this book recently and I found it really interesting. It's written by the author of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. And he's been a manga artist for 30 years. And he said that when he was 16, he really wanted to win a manga contest. A manga is a Japanese comic book and he really wanted his manga to be submitted. However, he never got through. And so what he did was he looked at all of the best selling manga and looked at how they did their first pages to make a page turner to draw the reader in. So if you have got a sticking point and you're stuck, have a look at how the experts do it. It might be very subtle what they do, but if you look closely enough and you research, you could just find the answer to your problem. This is something that I don't think people talk about. I don't think they do, because when you go to school, they say, here is a book. You start on page one, you read through to page 400. That is how you read a book. I want to tell you, don't feel guilty about skipping ahead. Because seeing the later stages can help you gain an understanding of the earlier ones. Here we've got some Lego. If you know what you're building, you are gonna have a better understanding of why you are doing what you're doing. Just following instructions blindly isn't very helpful. Often by trying the later lessons, you can then really appreciate the fundamentals and how they're helping you. But also with that knowledge, when you do the fundamentals, you can ask the right questions because you know what you're building on. If you're making foundations for a house, and you don't know what kind of house you are building, you're not gonna understand why you're making it that size and shape. Whereas if you know what the finished product is gonna look like, you're gonna give it more care, attention, and know what bits need to be focused on the most. So seriously, don't 
stress out about skipping further ahead. And this applies to books as well as skills. Got some time off, got some extra time. Don't spend it reading two books cover to cover. Just, oh, such a waste of time, don't do it. Instead, pick up a book, look at the index, read the subjects in that book that you actually want to learn, that you're most interested in. You do not need to start at page one and read all the way to page 400. Read the bits that interest you. And if it's a really interesting book, then maybe you want to read the rest. But seriously, please, please, please do not waste all this time reading two books. Why not read 30 books? But just read the bits in those 30 books that you're most interested in and they're going to be the most helpful. I think that's a far better use of time than just saying, yeah, I read these two books, they weren't very good. Don't be afraid to skip ahead. Don't be afraid to go to the right sections. And as we said earlier on, have a practice schedule. Have a schedule for when you are going to practice. We said about having 15 minutes a day at least for practice. Why not just set a time that you're going to dedicate to your practice? That's going to make you feel really good at the end of the day and say, I've spent time practicing. If you want to do it while watching TV, have a time you watch TV. Because what seems to happen is if you don't have a time to practice stuff, the day keeps going later and later and later and later and later. And then last thing at night, you're like, should I sacrifice sleep or should I do it? Or should I just go to bed and do it twice as much tomorrow? Be honest with yourself. When are you most alert? When are you freshest? That's the time you should be doing it. And as we said, log what you practice. Because that's going to make you feel good looking back saying, yeah, I practiced this on this day, this on this day, this on this day. Then you can map your progress and see whether you need to sh shake up how you're doing stuff. And also remember to work towards a goal. Today we've talked about goals and got you to think about what goals you want to work towards. Remember to make it exciting and to be excited about what you're doing, you'd have an exciting goal to work towards. And that could just mean plan to do something with your skill. If you're learning baking, maybe you want to make someone a birthday cake after all this craziness is over. If you want to juggle, maybe you want to go to a nice garden party later in the year and do some juggling. Maybe you want to join a circus. It's up to you. But plan to do something with your skill. Today we have covered goal setting, taking useful notes, online coaching and how to practice. And I'm going to open up in just a second to some questions and answers before we close. But first, I just want to announce that if you would like coaching with me, dun dun dun, while I'm off, I'm offering some pinpoint coaching sessions, Bow! which means you can book a 15 minute coaching session with me on a topic of your choosing. Just send me an email to matt at jaggedmatt.com and just book in 15 minutes with me and we will have a call about anything you want to work on, all for free. Just a 15 minute call. If you want an hour with me, that will cost you. <laughs> but 15 minutes with me is completely free. And so now I'd like to open up to questions and answers, whether anyone has any questions. Yeah, uh, my name is Nick and I've got a question about a point you mentioned earlier on, which really resonated with me very nicely about uh, setting interesting challenges. Now, what I've done is I've, I've written a note on that and I've um, put the little equal sign with the word learning, because from my point of view, I do set goals for myself and I do try and reach them, but I also become rather aware that what I end up becoming when I'm getting close to my goal setting is often slightly different or evolved in a different way than I previously imagined it. Now, what would be your thoughts on that? See, I think that's actually, I think that's a more common problem than you might expect. 
because the problem I've had a lot is buying too many notebooks. Now I'll tell you how that relates. Mary knows this. What I have a problem of doing is thinking, I want to achieve blank, therefore I need this special brand new notebook to dedicate to becoming this thing. And I'm going to start on page one and carry on. By about day two or day three, I've changed my mind and my thinking has completely changed. And I think, oh, I need a new notebook now. I need a brand new notebook because I need a, one that has not been disgraced by these previous bad ideas and I can use it for my brand new goal. So what I discovered was, if I looked back at some of my older notebooks, a lot of the time, my ideas back then, I was now having again. But because I hadn't looked at those older notebooks, I had completely forgotten I was having the same ideas over and over and over again. I'd missed the patterns. And that's why I think if you have digital note keeping, even if your goal has changed and you're thinking to yourself, that's not appropriate anymore, you can file it and always come back to it if that has changed. That's my big thinking because at the time you are going to think it is rubbish, it is a waste of time, you need to get rid of it. But in five months you might be thinking, oh that was a really good idea, why did I give up on that? So file it digitally so then you can come back to it. And then if you're doing a practice schedule, of just 15 minutes a day, you can be more flexible. So if your goal slightly changed, adapt it and think, okay, my thinking has developed. And that's a good thing, incidentally. If you can prove through your notes that your thinking has developed, you've been making a really good use of your time. What's worse is to carry on just blindly doing something and not having learned anything. Know that you've learned and that you've developed, then just slightly change. And because it's all logged and recorded, you can explain to your future self, that's why I changed my trajectory on this one. And as long as you are still excited about it and you're interested in this new path, I think you're gonna do just fine. Really good question. Thank you so much, Nick. Any, any other questions before, before I go? I'm trying to see you all. <laughs> Hi, Mary. Yes. Hi, it's a very basic question, but uh, I have a big problem with doing digital notes uh, and sort of managing to keep on top of them. I've tried Evernote to some extent, but uh, I just can't get to grips with them. <laughs> this is my notes for today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ten pages. <laughs> so, uh, I mean that that's a huge challenge for me to to make sense of of, of, of something like Evernote. Okay. Ooh. What would you suggest? Well, I suggest well, <laughs> there there are a few things. I'd like to start off by telling you a little story about the coolest notebook I have ever seen. The coolest notebook I've ever seen belonged to Rachel Nage, who came round for coaching. And she had this very strange notebook with her. And she said to me, it uploads all of her notes straight away up to the cloud, even though it was a pen and paper notebook. I thought mm -hmm. that was absolutely fantastic. Another thing you can do is, you, I'm sure there's more software now for actually capturing your handwriting. So you can take a little picture and upload it. Another thing you can do is dictation software is slowly becoming better. Like with Google, you can dictate stuff and you can read it out loud. That's getting a bit better. But I think what's going to help the most is I think it'd be good to maybe arrange a session on using Evernote or using online note taking software to actually go through step by step. Some of the reasons why I like it is because you can get a plugin for it for your internet browser. So if you're reading an article or you see an image you like, you can just click on it and it saves it straight to your Evernote notebook. It's all there for you. So you don't need to waste your time copying articles outline for line. You can just copy the whole thing and it's there yeah. for you. 
So I think that's quite a good action to go from here is to arrange an Evernote workshop. So I will endeavour okay. to set that up. <laughs> Great stuff. Thanks, Any, thanks, Matt. No worries. Any yes, Tim. I was going to ask about the um, 12 week year party because I actually I remember you mentioning that a while back and uh, it's 12 weeks is a really good amount of time because it's not long enough to sort of be sort of forgettable but it's not short enough as to be meaningless it re really works quite well setting quarterly goals I was wondering if you could talk more about the 12 week year party what you do at those sort of things how um, yeah what, 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 what they involve really yeah sure so it's a bit different to in person because in if it if we didn't have this stuff going on at the moment how it normally work is you'd say to your friends you're doing it with why don't we go out to celebrate or why don't we have a party around our house and do something nice something essentially you want to organize something you're going to look forward to and so doing it online what you could do is you could say we're all going to eat cake and sticky toffee pudding together online whilst we do this 12 week year stuff the main things to do 12 week year you do is you talk about what you have achieved over the last 12 weeks because then that means for the previous 12 weeks you've been thinking oh gosh, oh gosh, I'm going to have nothing to say at this party. That's going to be so embarrassing. I better get my rear in gear and get some stuff done. So you do. So that's quite a good motivator for a lot of people. So that's the first part is saying what you have done in the last 12 weeks. The other part is just discussing your goals for the next 12 weeks, what you want to achieve. And then what's fantastic about having other people with you while you do that is they're going to not be so nice. They're going to ask you specific questions and say, well, how are you going to do that? What are you going to be doing week to week to achieve that? Or that goal is, it's meaningless. How are you going to achieve it? What are you actually going to be doing? What are your action points? And so I'd say the three parts of a 12 week year party you need to do, Part one, you need to have some sort of form of celebration, something you're going to look forward to. Part two, you need to have a part where you discuss what you've achieved over the last 12 weeks. And number three, you also need to tell about what your goals are for the next 12 weeks. When, when we did it last time in person, it was really fun because we introduced board games and things as well. So the more you can make it into a nice, enjoyable occasion, the more you can actually get the stuff done. Enjoy it. Thank you so much. It's a really good question, Tim. Any final questions before we wrap up? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry if I can't see Macy for a time. <laughs> uh, oh, no, no more questions. Speak up if you do or forever hold your peace. Okay. I see not then. Thank you all so, so much for attending today. I've been recording it, so it's there for playback. You didn't get everything, but I just hope it's been useful and you've learned a thing or two, but thank you so much for attending. And this goes towards my Postmasters webinar project. So thank you so, so much for attending today. And most of all, I sincerely really, really hope you each get as much as you possibly can out of this time. And you see it as a really good opportunity to get some great stuff done. And I really look forward to hearing what you achieve because I know it's going to be amazing stuff. So thank you all so much. <laughs> and I'll see you soon. <laughs>